Okay, um, so good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming along to hear me uh, talking about teaching Linux. Uh, lessons I learned from my students, that's you guys, for today at least. So, um, yeah, a bit about myself. I've been doing Linux, embedded Linux, for 20 something years, uh, written a book about it, blah, 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 blah. But the point about this then is, um, well, first of all, it, it's, it's really in two parts. Um, first of all, I just want to go down memory lane a little bit and remember how things started out. And I want to go through some of the dev boards I've been teaching with over the last 20 odd years. Um, but the main point of this really is uh, the second part. I want to talk about what it's like uh, to be a teacher, uh, the good things, the bad things, um, how I got involved in this kind of thing, and um, uh, the final part really is, I wouldn't encourage you guys to do the same. You should be standing up here, not me. So, so first of all then, uh, Linux down the decades. Um, so this is where I started out hardware-wise. Uh, 2002, I was teaching using these boards as, as the target. Um, and this just gives you uh, an indication of the way things have changed over the last 20 years. So this was, um, this is not exactly state of the art, but it was a pretty common uh, target board. So it's 50 megahertz, uh, PowerPC 823. Actually the, the 860 was much more popular. There's a lot of products at that time based on the MPC 860. Uh, we had 16 megabytes of RAM, which we thought was a lot. Um, we had four megabytes of NOR flash memory, which even then didn't seem very much. So uh, you had to be pretty careful to condense everything down to fit into four megs. Um, and then we had the usual things. We had the Ethernet. We had RS-232. We had USB, although the USB on that particular board, well, on that particular chip, never worked that well. Um, but we weren't using USB that much in 2002, so it wasn't, wasn't a big deal. Um, and it had lots of GPIO pins, so we could plug in all kinds of LEDs and flash them on and off. That was the main reason for it being there. So what was happening in 2002? So from a personal point of view, I was teaching uh, embedded Linux and Linux device drivers uh, using this board. And we used this particular board, uh, or I used this particular board for five years, 2002 to 2007, roughly speaking. And Basically, I, I was and I continue to do uh, four and five day training classes on site for, for, for various uh, companies, organizations or whatever, business cards available later on. Um, and except that these days it's mostly done online, I mostly do things virtually. So that's the kind of um, background for what it, what it was all for. What actually was I teaching using? So at this time, we were, we were using two uh, Linux 2.4. Uh, 2.6 came out shortly after this, 2003, if I remember rightly. Um, but the board support for this particular MPC8XX chips was very slow to come along. So I think it was about 2005 before we got 2.6 working on this particular board. Um, it didn't seem to matter so much then. Things changed much more slowly back in those days than they do today. So it was perfectly fine that I was teaching the same version of Linux for like three years. Nobody seemed to, to worry too much. Um, we were using a tool chain. Um, at that time, I was uh, actually getting a, uh, a binary tool chain from, from Dynx. Um, I did attempt to build my own tool chain a couple of times, but again, at that time, building a tool chain was a tricky thing. There was a, a list of instructions about three screens long, and you had to type them all in by hand, maybe turn them into a script, but uh, it was a bit um, hit and miss. And you know, basically, I was teaching what, what we call roll your own uh, Linux. So you would start with, with nothing except a tool chain, then you compile your bootloader, your kernel, uh, libc, and other libraries, and the file system, and then you put it all together. And that basically took the whole four days. Uh, it was good fun. Um, but at that time, that was the only way to do it. Um, build root and open embedded were around. Well, build root initially was around uh, 2001. Uh, open embedded came along in 2003. But 
they were not considered, well, from my point of view, they, they were kind of unstable and not really kind of production ready. Apologize to anybody who's listening or in the audience uh, who was, who was uh, working on with those at the time. But they were not generally used. Open Embedded was not commonly used uh, until like 2007 or 8 or some, sometime later. So you're very much on your own. It was kind of put it together yourself. Um, Linux itself was considered uh, a really risky thing by most people. And the quote I give there is, uh, how can you maintain quality if anybody can contribute? I mean, Linux, <laughs> they were comparing it to other, other less uh, reliable things, I think. So yeah, the whole concept of open source and, and contributing to stuff was kind of a novel thing uh, to everybody then, whereas now it's just a novel thing to most people uh, these days. Um, but then, during that time, 2002 to 2007, when I was using this particular board, I saw Linux go from basically nothing um, to, by 2007, it was, it was kind of mainstream. It was kind of the thing, the thing you would do. It would kind of be the, the default choice for, for, for a lot of uh, projects. So that happened really quite quickly. And what were people using it for? So kind of everything. Um, industrial control, set-top boxes, printers, all kinds of stuff was coming along. And the typical story was they had a product already running something like VxWorks or PSOS or DOS. DOS was still pretty common in those days. Um, somewhat lesser, so Windows CE. Uh, I say not so much so because we didn't really have uh, really reliable, uh, really easy to use graphics on, on Linux uh, until a little bit later on. So that was that was kind of the start of the of the road for me. Um, for no particular reason, 2007, um, I switched to using this particular board. So it's from Digi. Um, it's an ARM. It's an ARM processor, 926, 155 megahertz, really fast, 64 megs of RAM, 128 megs of NAND flash. So, uh, and again, this is fairly typical of contemporary embedded devices. Um, the ARM 926 was very, very popular and continues to be quite popular uh, until quite recently. So I was using this board roughly 2007 to 2010. And by this time, we'd actually switched to using Linux 2.6. Woohoo! Um, mostly, I was using a tool chain from MontaVista. And then later on, we switched to using the Angstrom tool chain, Angstrom being open embedded, as I'm sure you all know. Um, but we weren't using open embedded for the, the main build system. So still basically roll your own. And again, that was typically what people did. We're still very much in the roll your own kind of days. And like I said, silicon vendors, set top boxes, printers, industrial control was the kind of thing that people were using this stuff for. Uh, 2012, BeagleBone Black. So um, I love the BeagleBone Black. Um, I, I still use it uh, for some of my classes even now because it's a really nice little package. It's easy to get to. It's nice and open. So yeah, nice little board. Um, single, still a single core 32-bit um, ARM, but that was, again, that was kind of typical of the day. Um, had a GPU. I think this was the first board I had with a GPU on it. Um, it's only later on I discovered what you could do with a GPU, but uh, that was there. Um, half a gig of RAM, two, two or four gigs of, of, uh, of uh, flash memory. And um, yeah, mostly using Yocto. Yay, Yocto. So finally, by 2012, Yocto was, was kind of becoming mainstream. Uh, I mean, Yocto only came a, about in 2010, so that's fair enough. Uh, and also build root. I don't know if any build root people are here. Um, so, as, as you know, build root went through a, through a bit of a, a lull. Uh, but by 2010, 2012, it was uh, it was on the up, and it's also it remains one of my favourite build systems. Um, and then Android happened, so I started running Android on Beagles in uh, well about 2012. Actually, it was one of the main reasons why I switched to using the Beagle. So uh, Jelly Bean through to Nougat. 
Um, then in 2017, I switched to Raspberry Pi. So now we're getting to kind of more modern things. Everybody knows what a Raspberry Pi is. And the Pi came along mostly because I was doing more and more Android stuff, and I couldn't get um, anything beyond uh, Android 7 to work on a BeagleBone because it doesn't have enough memory, and the graphics chips, uh, the, the graphics libraries didn't work, and so on and so on. And that pretty much brings us up to date. So that kind of, that's kind of the end of my stroll down memory lane. But we've got to a point now where Linux is dominant. Um, it is the default operating system for all mid and high-end embedded systems. Um, and, and because of Android, it totally dominates mobile. Um, and increasingly, well, it, no, increasingly, it also dominates automotive. So most vehicles are running Linux or Android or both. So hey, we won. So that's the background, and that's how I came to be do that. That's that's what I've been doing the last twenty years. Um, but really, what I want to talk about is why do I do this? How do I do this? And um, yeah, what, what are the, what are the the good things and the bad things of standing up here in front of an audience? Um, so the first question really is, is how did I get into this stuff? So I, I didn't wake up one morning saying, you know what, I'm going to become a teacher. That, that doesn't happen. It was a random sequence of events, as everything important in life is. Life is basically a random thing. So the first step was I started doing some stuff with Linux. So around about um, yeah, 2000, 2001 or something. I was working on, on a project with, a, cu with a, a customer, and the obvious choice for it was, was Linux. So somebody said to me, this Linux stuff would do that. I said, what the hell's Linux? Went and found out. So I was, and I, I looked at Linux, and I thought, hey, this is quite neat stuff. Actually, at, at one point, going off on a slight tangent, I remember sitting down in, in, in my little office in my, in my back room in my house, thinking, what shall I do? And I thought, I could do Windows CE. A lot of my friends are doing Windows CE, and they're making lots of money from Windows CE. Maybe I should do that. Um, and then this Linux thing came along, and I looked at that and thought, ah, screw Windows CE. I'm going to do Linux instead. That's a lot, more, a lot more fun. So I started doing that, and initially I, made, I earned zero money from it, but eventually it kind of caught up a bit. Um, so that was, you know, so I, I was doing Linuxy stuff. And then I went to um, a, a little trade show in, in, in the UK. Um, it's, it's called a tabletop. I don't know if you've ever been to tabletop shows, but essentially you pay a huge amount of money to rent a tabletop. And you put a few demos on there, and you have a, have a, uh, a poster explaining who you are, and that's, that's kind of it. So I did that, but I didn't do it very well. I had a little board running a web server, and I had something on my laptop just showing web pages, but nobody really understood what that was about. And I had a picture of a penguin, you know, Tux, but nobody, nobody knew what Tux was. People just walked straight past, thinking, you know, penguin guy, whatever. So... <laughs> So um, it wasn't initially a very successful show, and I was quite despondent by it. Um, but then the one person who actually did come and talk to me actually was a guy who ran a training company. And we had a brief conversation. I explained what, uh, what the Penguin's about and uh, you know, how Linux was going to take over the world. And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we kind of exchanged business cards. And then he went quiet, and then about 12 months later, he phones me up and says, that Linux stuff you were talking about, uh, we've got a bunch of customers who want to know about Linux, and we need somebody who knows what to tell them. Would you like to do it? So I said, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm kind of skinned, so I'll definitely do it. So that's how I came to become a trainer. Was it easy? Hell no. <laughs> it definitely was not easy. Um, <clears throat> So initially, so I, not only was I actually doing the training, I had to write all the materials to start with because there wasn't anything to, to, to start from. So I just sort of sit there tapping away. How do you know how long it's going to take to run a training course? This is, a five, this is billed as being a five-day class, so type lots and lots of stuff, that's got to be it. So the first time I did it, we actually ran out of material after about four days. So day five was basically a recap. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Please? 
<laughs> More questions? <laughs> but it worked out okay. Um, and then I kind of got into it. So what are the problems with, with standing up here like this? So, I, you know, I still suffer from this stuff. So th there's a constant fear that my, my biggest nightmare, my kind of night, my literal nightmare, <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night sweating sometimes, um, is being in the room and with, you know, everybody else knowing more about the subject I'm trying to teach than me. In practice, it doesn't actually happen, or at least it hasn't, hasn't happened so, so far. Um, because they wouldn't be taking the class if they do, do such stuff. And uh, even if they do know certain parts, so you, you always go into a sort of training class. There's always some people who, who've worked on some parts. So you'll find somebody who is an expert on Bluetooth or somebody who's an expert on SPI or whatever. Um, but you never find anybody who has the, or you seldom find anybody who has the kind of continuum of stuff. So that's kind of what I'm doing is, is kind, kind of building the, uh, the roadmap so that you can connect all the, all the various towns together. So that fear I kind of overcame. Uh, the other big fear is the fear that um, the people I'm teaching are smarter than me. Um, and then I realized, of course they're smarter than me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a smart guy by any means. So you just have to get over that, you know, whatever. You, you guys are all smarter than me, but whatever. I am the guy here talking to you, so <laughs> you better shut up and listen. So I, have, I have control of the clicker. So, so those are the fears. You, you kind of get over it, but it's, it's, still, it's still a bit tricky. What do people want to know? Well, I don't know. I, I kind of run out of bullet points here a little bit. I mean, people want to know, certainly in the early days when I, when I started out doing the Linux thing, um, people mostly want to know what the hell is Linux, how does it work, can we trust it, um, can we actually use this to build a real running product? And that was really my, my role was to kind of say, yeah, sure, don't worry, it works. Eventually it works. So um, the next few slides I want to have a, look at, a little look at kind of techniques of, of teaching and the various uh, things that you can do. Um, and I'm going to start off with the, the good old learning pyramid. So I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, so this is rates of retention, roughly speaking, for various um, mechanisms of delivering uh, content. So the one at the top there, lecture, this is the worst way of learning anything. So less than 10% retention. So yeah, what, what was my third slide? Who remember, hands up if you remember what was, what was on my third slide. See, nobody. I, I, could have, I could have skipped that slide completely, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice. And you won't remember, that, remember this one either. So the, the point is that just talking um, with, with a bunch of slides, it's kind of quite fun, but it, it, it's not an effective way of retaining information. So then going down the pyramid, um, reading stuff, sure, that you've got to put some effort into reading, uh, audiovisual, whatever. Demonstrations is interesting, so we tend to do a lot of demos as we're doing our talks. Now, I'll come back to that a little bit in a, in a couple of slides' time. But actually, watching a demo is more valuable than just um, somebody talking. So that's useful to know. Uh, discussions. So if you, if you can get some uh, discussion going on, on, a, on a topic amongst your audience, not, not now. Um, but that's a good way of, re of uh, retaining stuff. And then we get onto the big ones, practice doing. The best way to learn something is to do it. So we spend, as, as teachers, we spend a lot of time uh, preparing practical sessions and exercises and challenges and whatever. And then the biggest one of all is teach. The best way to learn something is to teach it to someone else. So that's how I learn things. Um, and I'm going to come back to this again, but um, yeah, really, I would encourage you to, to get all the way to the, the base of the pyramid and to do more teaching. It is the best way to become proficient in a topic. The other thing is that when you are preparing materials, um, how do you put things together? How do you tell a story? And there, fundamentally, there are two ways you can do this. You can either do top-down or bottom-up. So with top-down, 
uh, you basically start with the, the fundamental principles, and then you go into more detail and more detail, and eventually uh, you get to something. So you can imagine that this would be like learning uh, C++ by learning the syntax, learning the variables, all the different ways you can make assignments, all the different um, whatever you can do with C++. So you'd spend like four days learning the, the syntax, and then on the last day, you'd write Hello World. Obviously, that's not going to work. So top-down deductive is one approach. Uh, but it, it is quite attractive to a lot of people when you, when you think about uh, presenting something. You say, well, I'll start with the, you know, the basic principles, and then we'll work down, and we'll eventually we'll, we'll, we'll get to the, we'll deduce where we, where the point where we should be. It, it, it doesn't work by itself. So you go to the opposite extreme, and you go to the bottom up. So you say, well, okay, well, let's just start with examples, and then by if I show you enough examples, you will work out uh, what, the, what the syntax is. So this way, I would teach uh, C++ by giving you lots and lots of snippets of C++ code, and you would eventually work out what the syntax is and what you can and can't do. Obviously, that's not uh, also a, not a runner by itself. So the idea is to combine the two. So this is kind of obvious, but it's also not so obvious when you sit down and start writing material. Keep this in mind. You need to start off with a, with a framework, diagrams, uh, and then give some examples. Say, well, this is what it looks like. Um, and then from that, you can then say, well, let's tear this Hello World program to pieces and see what each line does. And then you go back to more principles. And basically, you kind of keep on flipping between the, up, the, the, the top down and bottom up. Uh, or at least that's, what, that's how I do it. Um, learning by doing. So this is the 75% um, the mark on that uh, pyramid. Um, so unsurprisingly, the best way, or a, a very good way for, for students to learn something is actually to try it out. So it's all very well me saying that uh, if you do these things, um, you will generate a, I don't know, uh, a Linux kernel or something. But actually building your own Linux kernel from scratch is a completely different uh, topic. So uh, you, you're going to remember that much, much better. So it's important to intersperse the, the kind of just me boringly talking about stuff and actually have a chance to, to try things out. And from the student's point of view, I think people often get a little bit nervous about doing this because they think, oh, I might get, get it wrong. Actually, it's good if you get it wrong, but not on purpose, obviously, but um, making mistakes are, is, is good. Because it turns out you actually learn. If you make a mistake, as long as you learn by mistake, then uh, that's, a, it's, that's a learning experience. So one, one of my favorite phrases is, um, you know, everything is a learning experience. Even when it goes terribly wrong, you are learning things. So when things go wrong, that is good, so long as they don't go completely wrong. Um, and also, when, you, when, you're, you know, when you're actually there uh, and the students are doing the, the labs and whatever, it's a great opportunity to try things out, kind of tweak things a little bit. What happens if I do it this way around, whatever? You know, it's, a, it's a great kind of uh, sandbox where you can try stuff out. Uh, live demos. So I think at 30% on, uh, uh, on that pyramid, uh, it was demos. So demos, good and bad. So the thing is, I, I know some lecturers who actually do their entire uh, lecture as a bunch of live demos. No slides, no nothing. They just stand there and say, well, here's how you write this program, here's how you write that program, whatever. It's very impressive. I couldn't do that. It requires a lot of concentration and a lot of uh, ability. But it isn't a solution. Um, as we said, live demos, they're better than just listening to somebody chatting on, um, but it's not a substitute for actually doing the stuff yourself. So don't kid yourself that doing live coding, live demos is actually solving uh, all the problems. It gets you a little way there, but you still need to actually sit down and do the stuff. So problems with live demos, if you're just doing it uh, kind of on the fly as we are here, then people will misremember what it is you typed. You say, oh, yeah, this is how you build a kernel. Boom, boom, it's gone off the screen. People maybe didn't notice that. 
Or maybe they misunderstood why you're doing this. Maybe you didn't explain exactly why we need to build a kernel or um, what kind of kernel it is you're building or whatever. So it's easy for people to kind of misunderstand the, 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 the reason you're doing this demo. However, live demos do uh, have a function, so I do use them myself quite a lot. Uh, they're great as long as you keep them short and keep them snappy and keep them focused. So if your live demo goes on for more than like a couple of minutes, you're probably doing the wrong thing. But it's great to say, okay, you know, da -da -da, this is what it really looks like. Be aware that when you type, um, you know, make to build your kernel, it's not going to happen instantly. Uh, you'll need to come back in a few minutes. The other thing is that I've seen live demos work really well if you are recording the session. Because the great thing there is that people can uh, re rewind and pause and, 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 and kind of review what you do. So the, the, the command that kind of shot off the screen when you hit enter, uh, they can kind of go back and see exactly what that command was. I still don't think it's brilliant, but it's, um, some people like doing it uh, uh, that way. Uh, questions. Questions are good. We'll come to this in a few minutes. Um, so it, it, from a uh, presenter's point of view, uh, it's great because it, it means that uh, I get some ideas as to what it is you're interested in, what are the problems, maybe, I've, uh, miss, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I haven't explained something uh, very well. The other thing is that, particularly if you're doing a, a long, kind of day-long presentation, as I often do, it's a great opportunity to stop talking for a while <laughs> and take a, take a drink of water or something. Uh, point three is a little bit questionable, perhaps. I've written here, there are no bad questions. This is not literally true, let me just say. <laughs> um, but, yeah, feel free to ask questions is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so when in a, in a couple of minutes' time I say, are there, are there any questions, I really don't want the room to go quiet. You must have a question. Um, uh, because, you know, it, it, you know there have got to be questions. I haven't, done every, I haven't explained everything perfectly, obviously. Um, so, so, yeah, there are no bad questions as so long as the questions are on the topic uh, under consideration here. And from the presenter's point of view, the teacher's point of view, um, Answering questions is also a little bit uh, of, of, a, uh, of a worry. So will I know the answer? So the, answer, the, the point here is that you have to admit if you don't know the answer to the question. So if I don't know the answer to the question, uh, I'll just say, I don't know. But I will find out and get back to you. But there's no point making, question, making answers up, which some people I know do do, especially politicians. Um, key point then, learn from your students. So this is, comes to the base of the pyramid, the 90%. This is how you learn. Um, and I mean, I, sometimes I've been teaching the same material over and over again, like, like dozens of times. And yet, even if you've done the same class a dozen times, you still get the unexpected question. Somebody will say, uh, uh, the 12th time you do it, um, you know, some whatever, um, and you'll think, no, I never thought of that before. I never, nobody ever asked that question before. I never, never asked the question myself, but it's a really good question. Um, so that kind of triggers you, and you think, well, okay, I really ought to know. You know, what exactly is an inode? As somebody did, did ask me one time. I thought, oh, well, I don't know, it's a thing. Let me find out exactly what thing it is. So it kind of triggers you to go down uh, a particular rabbit holes, which is good. Um, the other thing is um, unexpected results of labs. So this happens to me quite a lot. So I look over, somebody said, oh, it's not working. And I look over the shoulder, and there's an error message there which I've never seen before. I said, what the hell have you done here? Um, but again, it's interesting to uh, kind of probe uh, into that and find out, well, yeah, how did they get into that situation? Uh, is this something, you know, this is something I should, have, should be aware of? Um, this is something I should warn. You know, there's, there's a bear trap here I should warn people away from, perhaps. So, um, no, again, it, 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 it's, it's part of the interchange. You, know, you, don't, you may not realize this, um, but when, you, when somebody is teaching you, they are also learning from you the whole time. Uh, be open to comments and criticisms. So, um, if you spot uh, spelling mistakes or, or uh, errors in my slides, then tell me about it. I really, really want to know. 
um, because, uh, no, no, not now. <laughs> Yeah, I put that, that was on purpose, obviously. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, interesting little uh, uh, side uh, uh, topic on that. One time I was teaching a particular bunch of people, um, really, re really, <laughs> really engaged, shall we say. And um, towards the end of the, of the, tra of the, the training sessions, um, one of them, a lady comes up to me in the, in the coffee room and said, um, we, we've made a list of errors in your slides. And I said, oh, yes. Uh, she said, uh, I'll send you a link if you like. I said, OK, a link to what? He said, well, we, on, on the first day, we set up a web server and a chatbot. And we've been, we've been kind of recording all the, <laughs> all the mistakes you've made on that. <laughs> Uh, we'll just send you a link and you can just copy it. So I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the effort. But um, so, yeah, it's fun. Um, sometimes uh, you get somebody who has domain knowledge of something I'm trying to explain, and they know more about it than me. Not a problem. Uh, as long as they're prepared to explain it to the rest of the class, they, they can have the, uh, the, the, they can take over. Fun things that happen. So another couple of uh, anecdotes, not particularly relevant maybe, but I remember one time, um, so the standard thing you do in any embedded lab, the first lab you do is to turn an LED on and off. Um, you know, it's, it's still fun. I really love flashing LEDs. There must be something in my brain. Um, so one particular time we do this exercise, and this one group, instead of just turning on and off, they, don't, they got it to fade. So it, it kind of faded slowly from off to on and back again. Um, I said, how do you do that? Oh, we just pulse, pulse width modulated it in, in software using this little loop here and that loop there and whatever. I thought, wow, that's pretty impressive. I'd never seen anybody else do that. So that was neat. And the other fun thing was um, uh, one time we used to have, I don't know if you've seen these, you can get the little toy missile controllers. They're USB things. And you can, you can move the, the little launcher up and down and left and right, and then they fire a little, little missile with a foam thing on it. It causes chaos um, when you do this with, with 12 people, but it's, it's, it's quite fun. So one particular bunch, they had not only done that, they'd written the, the, the control program for the missile launcher, um, but they also had uh, integrated OpenCV and face recognition. So as you walk past it, it would kind of track, <laughs> kind of lock onto you, <laughs> and then <laughs> hit you on the nose. So that was impressive too. They, they got uh, extra marks for that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, teaching is fun. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not totally easy, but it's worth the effort. So I've got a couple more slides, and then we will do the Q&A. Um, so what are my takeaways? You've always got to have takeaways. So seriously, uh, the, the, one of the things I wanted to, to, to get out of this is to encourage you guys in the audience to um, think of becoming a teacher. Not, maybe not full-time, but doing it sometimes. So teach people, lead discussions, guide workshops. It's fun. Uh, it's a great way to learn, as we've, as we've uh, discussed. It's a great way of helping your colleagues in within your company and also within the community. And fundamentally, we need to spread the word. Otherwise, we keep making the same mistakes. Um, and generally speaking, if you sp speak to um, the people who are doing training, including, say, Dulos, who I, I know are here, and uh, uh, Linux Foundation, whatever, they always say it's really, really hard to find people who can teach. So consider that. So call to action. Um, I want you all to go out and uh, start thinking about giving talks within your company, kind of little uh, stand at lunchtime things maybe. Uh, attend local meetups for whatever is interesting to you. Uh, upstream something. Um, contribute at meetings, ask good questions. Be engaged, teach others. So that is basically it. We have time for some questions. The slides are uploaded to that place there, but they're also in the, um, uh, in the shared thing. So that's be done. So 
I think we have time for uh, questions. Who wants to lead off? And I'm afraid, Marta, you'll have to deal with the microphones. On normally on the microphone size uh, side, uh, four questions. We have microphones on both sides of the room, so you can do cues for questions. I have one from the queue from the virtual audience. It's more of a comment, but your comment to that comment would be interesting. <coughs> Something I'd like to share about learning. Memory is the residue of thought. When we get stuck on a problem, have to think and work hard to solve it, we are more likely to remember what we've learned. Uh, that's, that's almost poetry, yes, I'll, I'll include that in, in my... <laughs> Uh, in my slides, but no, no, no totally. Uh, you and, and, and this is a challenge to to um, to me uh, when you can get coming up with 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 the labs. You've got to think of something that's interesting, relevant, uh, difficult, but not too difficult. So it's a difficult it, it, it's a difficult thing of, of uh, combination of, of uh, things you need. But that's the ideal thing. So what you do in practice is is I always have like three labs. So there's one lab which is basically copy and paste, and it, you know, everybody, everybody will do the first lab. Uh, the second one is something that's a little bit more challenging, but which co which covered which was covered uh, on the slides. So it requires you to read the slides and you know do some deductions from that. And then usually I do a third one, which is kind of tricky, which is extending that and doing something um, uh, uh, something that's going to cause you to 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 think a little bit. Uh, how do you avoid um, getting the exercises to be basically kitchen recipes for people? How do you make them so that they have to fo think and they have to well, get yeah. the knowledge in? Because I have had people that uh, basically wanted a kitchen recipe. I want to do this, I want to do that. And, yeah. and they want the answers in the exercises. And I hate that. So that, that, that's a tricky thing. So that, that's, that's why I say it. it uh, I, I try to structure things so that there's one copy and paste thing which everybody can do, uh, and then there's one that they're going to have to think a little bit about, and then there's another one which they're going to have to think a lot more about. And the, the other thing is I always give kind of solutions. So if somebody is, is, uh, is totally stuck, you can say, well, go read the solutions guide. That is a copy-paste solution to, to the exercise. So if you're really stuck, go do that. But Really, don't go to that straight away. Uh, have a go at solving the problem first, and then come back to the, uh, the copy-paste so, uh, solution. We have like two minutes. Yeah, hi, Chris, uh, on, oh. on this side. Uh, thanks for this. It's a, love to hear, hear your experience on that. Just curious if you see any fundamental difference between uh, teaching in a, in a scenario like this where you're giving a talk, you know, just a, a, a one-hour talk versus the, 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 the longer-term training sessions that you put together. Is there anything fundamentally different that you do to prepare or um, just, you know, anything fundamentally different in the way that you present the material? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's totally, totally different experiences. So if, if you're doing uh, a, a presentation like this, then first of all, you've got a very limited space of time, and we're about to run out. Um, the other thing is that, to be honest, you've got to be a little bit entertaining. So you've got to, uh, you know, you, you want to put in a few throwaway comments in, because as well as being here, it, this is also a little bit of entertainment. So I do approach them totally differently. Okay, on the slide with the pyramid, you made a point that uh, a lecture uh, has actually worse retention than just reading. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, uh, what's really the point of doing lectures? Why not just <laughs> maybe <laughs> hand out some reading material and then do a Q&A session about that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> why, were, why are we all here? Um, <laughs> so... The, I mean, there are, there are two, two ways of looking at that. So first of all, in, in, in this kind of environment, the point of the lecture really is to bring everybody together and to give a focus on, on a topic. Um, so you won't remember every word that I've said, but you can go look at the slides 
And it kind of gives you a lead in and, and, and a kind of an interest in it. Otherwise, if, if the presentation were, sorry, if, if the entire conference were just a bunch of slides on, on, on SlideShare or something, nobody would, would pay any attention. So the, the, the lecture is basically uh, a, a focus. Um, so I'm getting the stop now sign from Marta, so I better stop. But anyhow, thank you all very much. And, uh,